So a bit of a, bit of a parental advisory warning first. Um, apart from the fact that I'm so old now, I have to write stuff down and read it, it's, which is a, and wear my glasses to see what I'm doing. So when I agreed to do this talk, uh, I didn't realize it was going to be an economics lecture. So I apologize for the fact that there's a lot of, the, there are some numbers in here. Uh, or at least that's what it felt like last night over a glass of wine. Uh, and this, this sort of feels like one of those late afternoon lectures you had at college when you didn't want to go and all you wanted to do was get the lecture out of the way, go and watch Countdown before you went out on the lash and had a Chinese later on, that sort of thing. Some people have obviously been there. <laughs> Countdown, the beer, Chinese. What's wrong with that? But it's three o'clock, so, so let's, uh, let's see what happens. Um, so, let's make sure it's there. So, really, political turmoil or, or, or global turmoil has sort of hit our, hit the world again and is affecting supply chains in 2019, and it'll go into 2020. And you think about the Trump-China China trade wars, Brexit, tensions in the Persian Gulf, tensions in Iran, impeachment in the U.S., a new British government, I think we can call them that, and now coronavirus, okay? And it seems now, I come here quite a lot, and I, I talk to at these things quite a lot, and it almost seems now that this sort of wave of turmoil is almost an annual thing. And we've got to the point where we, we, we're almost immune to it, and we just ignore it. It's just business as usual now. The stuff that goes on is just business as usual. This time, what I wanted to talk about this time is this time there's a sinister, sort of sinister, sounds a difficult word, but a sinister backlog of... Of, of potential resource issues that are going to hit us in the next, probably the next decade, next 10 to 12 years. And a supply chain, a supply chain, set of supply chain organizations that, that are slowly waking up to the fact that there's going to be less working population and therefore we need to take on board automation, robotics, AI, to actually, to actually uh, close that gap. So this is another one of those things to add to your list of, list of things to do. Okay, so it'll be at the bottom of your list of things to do. It's, I'm not a doomsayer. If we could call this a fable, okay, let's call this a fable. I'm going to give you a fable. Because fables are sort of portents of, the, portents of the future. And you can exaggerate a little bit when you talk about a fable. And I'll exaggerate a little bit in here to make the point. Okay, so... There have been massive changes in the world around us, massive changes influencing our supply chain. So, and resources, skill shortages, talent shortages have been probably on all of our agendas for last five years. I was going to say five years, probably 10 years now. You come to things like this and people always talk about skill shortages. But the driver shortage I think we all experienced in 2018, we certainly experienced it in European transport. Uh, and, and to a degree last year, gave us a little bit of a glimpse of the true impact of, 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 of a, a loss of resource. Brexit adds another layer to that. In the UK, we have massive, massive fulfillment centres now, significantly operated by non-UK workers. So that will have a big impact on us. And our industry is not really known for its speed of change. I think that might be an understatement. We, we tend to be laggards. So it's incumbent on us to, to, one, understand what's happening, and two, start to formulate a series of, of sort of um, actions that we can take in the short term and the medium term to overcome some of the stuff we're going to talk about. Now, the idea for this came from... Um, two papers I read about a year ago, one by Bain and one by McKinsey. And they'd been written for the, I think they'd been written for the United Nations, and they're really good papers to go and take a look at. And they, the, the United Nations had asked them, and the British government had asked them to project forward a decade to see what would happen uh, with, the, with the changes in demographic graphics and the growth of the population, what was going to happen in the next 10 years uh, to the resource. And, and here's how it flows, and I need to read this, so I apologize. Um, firstly, population growth, increasing the demand for products. Okay, so demand for resource going up. It's a bit annoying having to keep doing this. Secondly, 
demographics, and we'll talk about that in a minute, reducing the working population, so supply going down, so demand going up, supply going down. The logic, automation fills the gap that's left by demographics. So it increases productivity and supply goes up. New skills required because suddenly we're doing, we're asking workforces to do different things. So we've got a workforce that needs to be retrained, so supply sort of semi goes down a little bit. And that creates potential inequality in wages and in social areas, a little bit like now, where those with the skills are able to benefit from the skills and those without the skills have to be retrained and now that we end up with this inequality. So that really drives um, key challenges for governments and for business to overcome that process. So that's the, that's the flow and that's what I'll talk about in the next 15, 20 minutes. So let's look at, look at population. The first one of those is population. So world population continues to grow at around about 1% per annum, okay? So the total global population is 7.88 billion, they think. I don't know how they counted it, but they think. Uh, so that means that each year we add, what, what's 1% of that? 80 million. We add 80 million to the population of the Earth, okay? In my lifetime, and it's probably not a great measure because I've had such a long life, but in my lifetime, the world population has trebled. Okay, so that's in, in 59 years, the world population has trebled. Okay? And there's a working population of around about 2.8 billion in the world. And I, I'm not sure they really are. I'm not sure how they work out what that working population is in some of the Asian economies, but there's a working population of around about 2.8 to 3 billion. So, population continues to grow. But the, the, the other side of that is that the working populations that always fueled the growth. So we've had this massive upsurge in the last 100 years of, of, of economic success. Massive upsurge in of economic success, principally driven by the fact we've had a lot of workforce. And, and technology has helped a little bit. Okay? But that era of abundant workforces really is, is probably going to end. And we're going to have to adapt to that fact. And the reason for that is firstly baby boomers, the me's of this world, we're starting to leave the, 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 the working economy. Uh, we're, we're getting to a point where we can afford to leave the working economy, we have a lot of wealth, and we're leaving the work, working economy. So there are fewer people available to work. We're living longer. So, so, so 73.5 years was the average age in the West in 1970. 80.3 years is the average age in the West in 2020, so it's going up by about 10% in, in that um, 50 years. We've increased in retirement age as well, so that's had a little bit of a positive effect because it means people are staying on in the workforce for longer. Conversely, younger people are entering the workforce later because one, it's too expensive to work, you go to college and you, you have to spend some time. Two, they, select, they choose not to work, they choose to go and do something else for a couple of years. And people can't leave school at 16 anymore, so that area of going into our economy changes. And that tends to lead to stagnation in, in our workforces. Now, that should be good news for key talent workers. So young people with, talent, with certain talents, that's good news for them, okay? Because they've got talents that everybody wants. But it is a little bit of a tale of two workforces in reality. Um, those people whose jobs will be replaced by automation tend to be the low to middle skilled workers. And they're the people that will suffer in this process. And if you take as an example the UK. So this is the UK population by age uh, last year. And the orange bit is the working population, effectively the working population. And if you project that, and, and what you see is that, that, little, that little sort of, what do you call that? Valley, what's it called? Van Nadia? No, is that, yeah, whatever. That little chunky bit out. And if you project that forward, what you see is you see that, that little hollow moving into the working population. And that's the, that is from the 60s. So in the 60s, suddenly we discovered mass contraception and suddenly people stopped having babies, okay? Or had babies later, 
And that's effectively what that is. That's, that's that, that lump coming through. So what you can see is that sort of moves through. So we have less and less and less. And that will continue for a little while because that lump, that chunk will continue to go through. So we're going to be in this situation for a number of years. And it's not just the UK. If you look at all European economies, so the top left for you shows each of the European economies and the labour supply growth rate. And you can see things like Germany, okay? Major problem in Germany. They have a very old population and their, their, their labour supply is not growing as fast as it needs to. And then on the top right, it's the labour shortage that, that's, that's, that's mapped out. And you see again Germany. And these are two scenarios. It's a 10-year scenario and a 20-year scenario. So they've taken two different growth rates and have projected those. And you see again, most European economies have a major issue. And it's not just Europe. So if you look at China, Australia, Japan, and South Korea, exactly the same. I couldn't get the USA, but I think it's very similar. Exactly the same. So you've got the, uh, the labor supply, the labor demand, 10-year labor demand, and then the gap. So each of those economies is in exactly the same place, other than India, which is just displaying a slightly different set of behaviors. And people don't really know what's going to happen in India. But there's 140 million new workers going to enter the workforce in India in the next 10 years, which is a lot of people. OK? So you can see population continues to, to grow. The working population stagnating or going down in certain Western economies. I told you this was an econo economics lecture. Please, if any of you want to fall asleep or light up a spliff out there like a student would, then go for it. There's a. And I, this is something I do have to read from my notes. Um, so th there's a key hypothesis here, and the hypothesis is population growth plus labor force growth plus labor force productivity determines the economic growth output, the rate that we grow, okay? So the population growth, increasing demand, the, product, the labor force growth, increasing supply, the productivity, the productivity growth, making that supply even better, drives the economic output. Okay, it's a truism. It's been true forever, okay? You can't grow your economy if you don't grow your people. You can't grow your people until you grow your economy. The two sit hand in hand. <coughs> so labor for, population continues to grow, and that creates greater demand. The older population continues to grow, and that means there's greater wealth, and therefore it doubles down on greater demand. Okay, we're going to spend more and more and more on healthcare. The, the converse of that is that we have a productivity problem in all of the Western economies. Productivity is reducing. As people move into wealth, to healthcare, that's a low productivity sector of our, of our marketplace. So the productivity dips even further because they're in a low productivity area. The OECD say that productivity grows. As I've just said, productivity has been stagnant for probably five to 10 years now. Um, capital investment that usually is input to increase that productivity has been stagnant since the global financial crisis of 2008. So we're not putting money into making things any more productive. This is getting really, if people want to cry, please do, go ahead, because it's getting very depressing. The converse to that is the delivery cost of a robot is getting better. Okay, they, I don't, I'm not sure I agree with these figures, but robot dexterity is this thing, you know, can a robot open it, crack an egg and drop a, you know, is it able to handle things, simple things? So it was 5.3 years, the delivery cost payback in 2016. They, they're saying now, I forget the report, I got this from 1.5 years in 2020, which I don't really believe in. Maybe that's for some robots. Fox, to the point where Foxconn in 2017 replaced 55% uh, of its total workforce in one factory, 60,000 workers, and that that's in, in itself says something. So 55% of your workforce in one factory equals 60K people with robots. The, the downside of that is the OECD, if you look at their reports, they still say that productivity driven, productivity of robots is driven by dexterity, and automation productivity needs to grow by 54% in robots over its current level for us to, to, to to, to fit the gap, to fill the gap, okay? But, effectively, 
Automation really is the diving catch. So, you know, yippee, hooray, um, Terminator saves us for once, okay? So, here's the complicated bit. There's always a but, and here's the rub for this. Automation technologies are gonna provide significant benefits for, for users, for businesses, and for, and for economies. The major growth area is gonna be cobots, okay? Robots that sit alongside people and work with people. Not necessarily standalone ro robots, cobots, and probably AI bots, those bots that manage your processes for you. <laughs> According to McKinsey, 60% of occupations can have 30% of their work activities auto automated by 2030. That means that 33% of all work activities with a midpoint of around about 16% can be, can, can be moved across to automation by 2030. And that means, if you do the calculation, that means between 75 million and 350 million workers in the workplace displaced, okay? We've still got, we still need the workers, but we've now got workers displaced that don't do the old things they did. And that'll vary widely across different uh, economies. Okay, the, the lower, the lower, um, sorry, the, the the more advanced economies will suffer more than the, the, the less advanced economies. So Germany, the U.S. will suffer more. <coughs> so as we said before, even with the demand, even with automation, there's going to be a demand for workers, and the work we need will increase. Populations are growing, economies are growing, infrastructure is growing, healthcare is growing. But what we end up with is the need for workers with different skills and therefore probably worker shortages in certain areas. Okay, so we'll have the workers, but we won't have the ones with the right skills. So workers need to adapt and develop new skills along, alongside these increasingly capable machines. The difficulty is the pace of technology change increases exponentially. Okay? Robots are better and better and better and better the rate of adaption of humans doesn't. We're about the same. We've got a level of productivity and adaptability, and we sort of stay at that level. So you've got robots doing that, and they're staying at that level. And that gives us two issues. Firstly, automation, as it comes in, is going to hit the lower end of the wage bracket, because those are the jobs that are going to be replaced, and therefore you're going to get income polarization and income inequality. Secondly, if that period of transition between bringing automation in and adapting workers to replace, to, to the new jobs they have to do. If that extends beyond a certain amount, you end up with this period of transition, okay, where suddenly you don't have the workers to fill the jobs and it affects the economies again. And actually it reduces demand again, so it sort of goes in a loop. So policymakers, employers, one have to emplace, have to embrace automation really quickly because it's the only way that we'll maintain this growth of our economies and therefore the growth of our wealth. But they have to quickly address those worker transitions. Okay? They have to very, very quickly address how we transition a worker from a series of skills that he or she has to a series of skills that he or she needs to have. If we don't do that, we end up with a completely, uh, an ineffective workforce, effectively. A, homeless, a, a group of Homer Simpsons. So, in supply chain, of course, we have to have another layer. We always do. We have to add something to it, to it, to it in supply, supply chain. So, the thing that adds to us in supply chain is, is the e-com growth, okay? Massive, massive e-com growth. 15% year on year in the last decade. Great bonus for supply chain, because you can see there, of every $100 in e-com sales, logistics collecting 12 to, 12 to 20, compared to three to five in bricks and mortar. So something we want, but actually adds another layer of complexity on top, and demand on top of what we're trying to do. You, you, you look at things like Alibaba and Amazon, um, and, and they're actually gaining competitive advantage now by encouraging us to, 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 to expect this faultless instant delivery. And they're moving, they're almost encouraging us to say, you don't want next day, you want the same day, you want two hour delivery. Because they know that that's a competitive advantage to them. 
So we've got this, this whole econ explosion in our, in, our, in our industry, really, really driving more granular, more data, more automation. And only, really, only automation can solve this for us, okay? There's no way we can solve this without having robots and bots and AI and machine learning doing this for us. So, summarize quickly. Let's go through this. We said population growth, increasing demand. We said Workforce reduction, reducing supply, threatening economic growth. Automation doing that diving catch, increasing productivity. A massive need for skills, new skills, not the old skills. The potential that it's going to drive inequality, wage inequality, and therefore reduce the demand for products. Laying down massive challenges for governments and for businesses. So hopefully you understand that bit, yeah? <laughs> right. Let me have a cup of coffee first. So, you know, faced with that scale of, 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 of disruption and transition, what a government could do is they could slow down the adoption of automation. It'd be an obvious thing to do, because then you slow down the transition, and you slow down the equality. The problem is, if you slow down the adoption of automation, you slow down the economy. Because we're not going to get any more workers. Baby boomers are gone. So we're almost on a train we can't get off. So it's, it, you know, we have to adopt automation. We have to retrain workers. We can't, there's nothing else we can do. Because if we don't, we have less workers, therefore we have less growth and less productivity, and therefore worse economies. So really, the, the, business, the businesses and the policy makers need to solve for five things. First of all, as I've said, they have to make sure we have economic growth. We have to have this economic dynamism going over the next 10, 20, 30 years. So projects, capital projects, the environment, job creation, really push small businesses, really push startups. Economies that don't expand don't create jobs. And economies that don't have people to do jobs don't expand. So it's that loop. The second thing we have, they have to focus on is upgrading skills. We have to identify the new skills and give those people the new skills. Either at the start of their career or at points throughout their career. We have to evolve our education systems. We have to improve labour dynamism. And what I mean by that is we have to be able to have a more fluid labour market that's able to adapt as it goes through its career. Mid-career retraining, early career retraining, later in the career retraining. We have to, or we, the government, have to rethink that transition support. They have to understand how they support those workers that are displaced in this process. Not in the way they do now, but they have to genuinely think about how we support workers as they go through this transition process. And, and really rethink the traditional safety nets, because they're just not good enough at the moment. And lastly, we all have to embrace AI and we all have to embrace automation, because there's no other option. <coughs> I sound like a, a robot salesman there. <laughs> so, Supply chain, of course, as I said, more critical. We still have physical things, we still move physical goods, we still have physical networks. And everything is changing for us already, okay? The world's not waiting for us. We have orders placed at any time, we have dispersed inventory in constant motion along our supply chains, more and more now. We have real-time tracking, an explosion, an absolute explosion of data and the analytics that we need to support that paperless, voice picking, everything. So the supply chain's not, we're, we're, not give, we're not being given that moment to take a breath. It's gone. We have to chase it. We're at the forefront of change, with e-com really, really driving that change. We're already seeing skill shortage in parts of our business, businesses. Our DCs can be one million square feet, okay? And they can, they can employ two to 3,000 people. 
Brexit applied to that, 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 that reduces the ability to move across borders. Potentially, and it's not a political statement, but if it does, gives us a major problem. Um, and you can see this, this was over the last five years. They've asked what are the top challenges in supply chain. And you can see that the, the skilled shortage, the, the, the availability of skilled shortages has remained at the top of agendas. And the, the complexity in here is we're now starting to fight for the same skills as the tech giants. We want the same skills that Amazon want and that Facebook want and that Google want. And people are not going to choose to come to our industry because we're fuzzy and we're old fashioned and we, you know, we don't project ourselves in the right way. You also have logistics companies now, in, and I'll explain that in a minute, investing at a lower rate. So logistics companies not wanting to invest in this new technology, so you get customers saying, well, okay, we'll invest. So that whole thing about logistics 3PLs being the innovators in our marketplace has just suddenly flipped on his head. Customers are innovating. Shippers are innovating. So we have to solve the problem. We have to solve the problem in a far shorter time scale and we have to be at the forefront of this whole process. So the whole world is having to deal with this problem. We've got a problem that's going to hit us before the rest of the world because it's already happening to us. And interestingly, so if you look at the way that automation has taken up in our, in our industry, so we know we have to take automation on board, we have to take AI, we have to take bots on, robotics on, but there are things stopping us. So, You've got this, this unusual competitive dynamics in the, of e-commerce. So Amazon, our customer, has suddenly become our competitor. So you've got this weird set of dynamics that, that are driving this whole take on of, of robotics and automation. <laughs> We've got an absolute lack of clarity about which technologies are going to win. We're in that old, and, uh, about 10% of this pop of this this group of people understand this, and I'm sorry if you, I'm looking at you for the 10%. We're in the VHS Betamax war again, okay? It's most of you don't even know what a video player is, do you? What's a video player? It's a video player, look, it's that. So VHS Betamax, this big selection of which type of video recorder and which type of videotape was gonna win. We're in that same war. Nobody knows which type of automation is going to win. So we're all sort of standing back a little bit and not investing. The time to implement the new technology. So this stuff is growing at 20 to 30% year on year. Companies are coming into the marketplace to try and resolve that demand. But actually, the delivery time of some of this stuff is getting longer and longer and longer. So you might want it. But because of the fact there's no supply out there, you might not get it for six to nine months. And six to nine months in our industry at the moment is six to nine years. Literally, you could be miles behind everybody else at that point. Companies, and look at their network for omnichannel, they're all different. Every single network, everybody's got a different idea, probably for good reasons about how they resolve omnichannel, because it's a different process. And 3PLs, have to build something that's economically viable. So they have to build something which is multi-user effectively to get their money back. And if everybody's got a different solution, they can't do that. So suddenly, the three PLs don't invest in this stuff and it's down to the shippers again. And lastly, there's this asymmetry. I, I wanted to use a big word. So this asymmetry between the length of contracts that shippers are willing to give three PLs and the payback on the investments they have to make. Shippers want to do one to two year contracts. The paybacks on this stuff is three to five years. So three PLs are not going to invest in the very stuff we want them to invest in. So we're having to invest ourselves. So there's something stopping us. The very thing we need to do, we're not doing. The very, the very blood that needs to course through our veins, we're stopping happening as we go forwards. So, We've talked a little bit about the, the, the impact of these changes in demographics and how they're forcing us to go down this route of automation. We've talked a little bit about how that affects the people that work for us. So I'm not sure what time is. Talked about the, the people. What time am I supposed to finish? Ten minutes. Oh, good, I've got ten minutes. That's cool. This will be the first for me. 
Um, we talked a little bit about how that affects the workforce and how we need to retrain and this potential transition gap and how we get over that transition gap and the need for us to rely on our governments to do something about that, you know, <coughs> no chance. And, and it is, it's a real problem. Our governments are going to have to be very different than they are now because they need to altruistically invest in this stuff. They need to help us do this. It can't be down to businesses because if it's just down to businesses, it will fail. Businesses won't, they'll have their own solutions, but, but in the majority it will fail. So if you look at automation, and we said that, we said that in supply chain the, the issue is quicker and the issue is bigger, just because we're on our way already, nobody's waiting for us. The cab's already left the hotel, the train's already left the station, it should be, but I got that wrong. So if you look along the whole supply chain, again, McKinsey chart, what McKinsey have done is they've, sh they've plotted all the elements of the supply chain and they've colour coded where all the investment's going in and where all the, the, the creativity is going into the different pieces of automation. And what you can see is the big investment at the moment is in warehousing, contract fulfilment. Okay? But there is investment in transport, less investment down at origin, but big investments in, in, in fulfilment. And what I thought I'd do is just quickly, quickly pull out one or two of these. The obvious one, fulfillment, we're having to invest. e is not allowing us not to invest in this stuff, okay? You look at the sheer pace of having to pick, the ridiculous pace now of having to pick and fulfill orders in four hours. The only way that can happen is with automation, okay? So there's massive investment going into automation. The International Federation of Robots said, the sales value of, of service robots for professional use has increased by 32%. So we're now, there's 9.2 billion of robots being produced in, in 2018. The market will quadruple by 2020, was there. I don't think it has, but that was that. That's the, sort of, that's the sort of scale of the change they're seeing is happening. So massive investment in warehouse, contract hub, and fulfillment areas of our business. Not all of us can afford that. So we have to look at other areas. The second area I think is a really interesting area is this whole area of, of, of digital freight forwarding. You're getting more and more and more companies now, containers, Zenita, Freitas, Transport and Zencargo, who are starting to use data and digital approaches to what's always been, if you come from a freight forwarding background, which I do, it's always been a very, very old-fashioned business. They started to automate things that we all said, well, you can't possibly automate that. What do you mean? What do you mean you can't have a piece of paper that goes with a container? Flop, piff paff. Bill of lading, can't have that as electronic. They're dealing with those things now. They're moving them out of the way. And what they're doing is they're changing the shape of the, 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 the freight forwarding market. And if you look at the lesson that you learn from tra the travel industry, okay? The travel industry, 1872, Thomas Cook in the UK created, effectively created the first travel agent. I'm sure he didn't, but that's the, that's, the, that's the rumor. In the 60s, we bought into travel big time. We had high street shops selling travel. Again, I'm probably the only one here who remembers that, going into the travel agents in a, in a, in a bar head or Wallace Arnold. That was the big one in Sheffield. In 1987, you got going places and first choice came up. So they conglomerated all those travel agents into big travel agents. In 1998, Expedia and lastminute.com got launched. And what they did was they digitized it. So suddenly you went onto a website and then you searched for your, tra your, your travel that way. Then in 2004, you got meta platforms being built. Okay, so tripadvisor.com, which is an interesting route they came through this anyway, because they started as a as a, a travel reference site, and booking.com. So now you go through a meta platform. I do. I don't know if all of you do. I go through a meta platform and I access all of this. And I don't know what the future will be. Perhaps it will be Terminator Black Box. But you can see that that same sort of thing is going to start to happen in the freight forwarding industry with these meta platforms starting to give you access to index linked rates that you don't have to go now to the individual freight forward in Hong Kong and the individual freight forward in Southampton Port and that all the documentation just go through a meta platform. The third one I wanted to talk about was just data and analytics. Um, and we talked a little bit about, so, so these 
that's expensive. That bit, you're aware that costs you money. You have to do it, but that costs you a lot of money. This is a thought of third party selection. This is something that everybody can do, okay? If you start to look at the data and the processes in your business, you can really, really start to uncover some massive opportunities to deliver real value. I spoke to a, a, a guy called David Warwick, and David Warwick is the um, supply chain development VP for Microsoft based out in Seattle. I spoke to him about four or five weeks ago, and we were chatting about this. And he said, you know, Mick, I can get my next two years of, of, of productivity growth from automation just by looking at the processes I do, just by looking at the data that I've got sitting there in front of me and analyzing it and taking intelligent, actionable processes and information out of that data. So it's not all about doing the really flash stuff or looking at other, it's other, other areas. It's about your data and your processes. And they're, you know, Microsoft are doing all the clever stuff. They're doing robots and they're doing you know, automated this and that. But he says our biggest area of opportunity is just in looking at our processes. And those processes that are replicable, we just automate them with a little bot. And it takes all that process away. The other thing he talked to me about was this whole rush that we've all got towards um, systems and trying to have that system that everybody else has got. And he called it, and we had the conversation, he called it digital lemmings. And it's actually something that's happening in, the, in, the, in all of our marketplaces at the moment. You know, we, this, 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 this whole thing about, wait, wait, why did we jump? Well, I jumped because I was just following blockchain. And it's true. It happened a long time ago when somebody invented the word 4PL. Oh, I've got to have a 4PL. What is one? Don't know. We've got to have one, though. And we're in that same arena now. We get blockchain. We must have blockchain and Bitcoin. Oh, we've got to do that. And we just go. And it's not the right thing to do. The right thing to do is to say, actually, there's some stuff here I can do that's easy. You know, I can change my process. I can automate my process. I can take that data and understand what that data says. And interesting, the last two jobs I've done, so DS Smith, and Lenovo, the first thing I did was to put in place a, a data and an analytics team. Because most of our data that we're using is completely unstructured. You know, it's, there's so much of it now, and it's all in different formats. DS Smith, we had 83 ERPs in DS Smith. <laughs> the logistics organization had to take 200 sources of information to get the data they wanted. Okay? The only way we could do that is we, we tried to automate it. We did a few little bots in it, but we just got really clever people and put them in an office and said, look at that data and give us this output. But it's the first thing I did in Lenovo and the first thing I did in DS Smith, and it works. So, we're finishing now. What can we focus on? Okay. I tried to define what I thought the new skills were. There's, there's loads of different versions of this, but there's certainly, interestingly, I think that the skills that... The work that will disappear is, what do they call it? They call it repeatable physical and mental activities. So those things that are just that, or they're just add up that line of fig figures, they'll be the first things to go, okay? So down the bottom, so if you're working on a, if you're working on a building site, you're probably okay, because that's an unpredictable process, okay? You've got to we'll take three bricks, no take two, and take them over there. And if you're working at the top, that's different because there's a different set of skills. It's those people in the middle that are going to suffer. So I think things like social skills, creative reasoning, logical reasoning, managing and developing people, the, the, the advanced analytics are the things that we need in the future. But I don't know. There, there are going to be a load of different skills that we need. So what can we do in the short term? Medium term, short term. Firstly, from a people perspective, we can start to look at skills in education. All of our businesses can start to look at the skills that we need, the new talent that we need coming into our organizations, and we can start to think about partnerships with universities and, and skills agencies to make sure we get the right things in our marketplace, in, in, in our organizations. Again, difficult to do this without a government that wants to do this with you. We can think about how we attract talent and skills, and that's about really about now we have to be, we have to offer flexibility in our packages. Okay, we can't just offer you come in, you go nine to five, you get this, and you get a ten percent bonus, you get twenty days holiday. It has to be far more creative than that now. 
So we have to think about flexibility work options. We have to balance it with contractors, which the new legislation doesn't help for all of us. Um, we have to think about the gig economy. A lot of negative about the gig economy, but it's interesting you talk to any Uber taxi driver, well, any, 95% of the Uber taxi drivers you talk to say it's great, I can do whatever I want to do. I just work when I want to work, and then the rest of the time I do something else. So we have to think about the gig economy and work from home. We have to think about how we maintain the capability. Older workers, baby boomers like me, who, and this isn't an advert, so baby boomers like me, who, who will walk out of organisations with, with 30 years of, of, of knowledge about how things work in an industry and real practical knowledge about that, will walk away. And suddenly you're left with younger people who, have to who probably end up making exactly the same mistakes we made over a 30 year period. And it, it, creates, it creates a sort of dis, disharmony in the process. So we have to think about how do we retain those older workers and give them what they want, which is they want to spend less time, they want to spend more time looking after their grandkids, or they want to do this, or they want to travel a bit, but also keep them in the workforce. So we need to think about how that happens. We have to start to think about this untapped market diversity. Again, really interesting. Just for Christmas, I did a, a, a conference in... in um, Amsterdam, and there's a lady called Vanita Wells from Facebook there. Really, really bright lady. She runs diversity in the supply chain for Facebook. And she was talking about how they were recruiting people to match the people they were selling to. So they were recruiting all these diverse areas of, of, of our population to bring them in and match against the people that they were selling to. And she says, it's, it's amazing, it's working so well. So we have to think about diversity. And finally, we have to think about employee engagement, strategies to fight for Generation Z and the back end of millennials, okay? These guys want to go on holiday after a year for six months. They want to travel around South America. I've got a son that's a, he wants to travel around South America. Okay? I'm just going to take six months off and travel around South America. So we've got to think about how we, how we engage and we retain those people. And then, really, on the process and automation, I guess the only thing really is, it's not just the big stuff. Don't be a digital lemming. Think about how you automate and how you put in simple bots and on processes to give you that productivity value and drive real change. Sweat the easy stuff, I guess, would be the right <coughs> way of putting it. So that's me, really. Um, I don't know whether that worked. It was a gallop through what's happening in economies and how we're adapting that for supply chain. This is just a quote from uh, Yossi Sheffi. If any of you follow him on LinkedIn, he's one of the, the senior uh, guys at MIT, Massachusetts Institute, and he always writes a very, very good blog. And he's saying, 2020 supply chains will have to steer through twists and turns of a highly uncertain world. The hand on the wheel is less likely to be human as we go through the process. Thank you.